Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I've waited so long to say this again. Welcome back to Reacteria! I know it's been a long time since we've seen each other, but I've got really good news. First and foremost being, I'm talking to you with an actual camera now. Secondly, I've got professional editing software now, which means there won't be any weird audio sync issues anymore. No more little clips where the audio just doesn't exist for some reason. And, possibly most exciting, I'm so happy to tell you that this episode is sponsored by NordVPN! <laughs> Really, genuinely, I just want to tell you that I do use NordVPN. Uh, I think it's an awesome service. I've never had any problems with them. My favorite way to use them is I like to watch things like Rick and Morty, which you can't get on Netflix in America, so I just connect to Australia, and then I can watch every single episode, even the newest season. That's really, really cool for me. And Nord is offering a special promotion for my subscribers. It's a massive discount on a two-year plan, plus one additional month free. And all you have to do to get it is go to nordvpn.com slash Labs. Now, I went to that URL before I told you about it because I wanted to make sure what they were offering you. And it looks like they're giving you guys 73% off that two-year plan. That comes up to a little bit more than $3 a month plus the additional one month free. So in total, you're getting 25 months of service for 79 bucks. That's legitimately an awesome deal. And it's actually cheaper than their one-year plan right now. So if you're interested in the VPN, this is an awesome time to get one, and it really does support the channel. Again, that's nordvpn.com slash Labs. And with that, let's get into the video because I feel like it's going to be a good one. Kevin, it seems uh, what you're describing here is that there is a large part of the scientific community uh, that is in kind of a, a desperate uh, attempt here to preserve age. Why is that? Time is the critical component for evolution. If you're going to say that a simple cellular system became a multicellular system that then became fish, and the fish then jumped up on land and grew legs and started breathing air, and then that creature grew feathers and wings and started flying. So if you give us time, we'll claim to account for all of this massive change of organisms, but we gotta have the time. Time is a critical factor in our understanding of evolution. Like I said in the last video about radiometric dating, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that the Earth has been here for a really, really, really long time. That's why the fossil record makes sense. We see layer after layer of plants and animals gradually changing in form over time. Yes, from simple to complex, eventually ending up in the complex forms that we have today, but even if you were to take away our understanding of the age of the Earth, even if you were to prove somehow that the Earth was 6,000, maybe 10,000 years old, it would certainly blow our minds. But we still have several other lines of evidence showing us how evolution works. So you wouldn't disprove evolution, you just show that it happens insanely fast. If you pull out the notion of a long period of time, uh, you're pulling out a major foundation uh, for the conventional paradigm. Absolutely. Evolution, specifically neo-Darwinism, requires a lot of time. And it's their foundational issue. You pull that out, they've got to come up with a whole new understanding because without time, they don't have anything. Again, that's just not true. Time does have massive explanatory power, yes. But this guy specifically mentioned Neo-Darwinism, 
which is the blending of Darwin's ideas with Mendel's ideas. Mendel was the guy with the pea plants that helped us figure out genetics. Darwin and Mendel never knew each other. They published their work around the same time. They never read each other's work. So Darwin didn't know anything about genetics, and Mendel didn't know anything about natural selection. But when you put these two ideas together, they help explain each other really well. And Mendel's laws of genetics really help us understand how accumulated phenotypic changes can cause macroevolution, which was Darwin's ideas. So that's what he's talking about. But even that model is severely lacking as well. For example, it leaves out things like epigenetics, which are changes not to the genome itself, but to the way in which the genome is expressed. It leaves out things like the microbiome. Like we have massive amounts of evidence that show that someone's gut biome has at least as much, if not sometimes even more control over things like their body fat content and their metabolism and so their overall health than their genetics do. So that kind of has this weird neo-Lamarckian twist to it. Lamarck was the guy that thought that heritable traits were something that were accumulated within an individual's lifetime. So like if you were to cut the tail off of a rat, all of that rat's babies then would be born without tails. Lamarck was wrong, but it turns out that he was kind of almost right because things like epigenetic changes and microbiotic changes are things that can happen within an individual's lifetime and can be passed on to their offspring, which can affect their evolutionary trajectory. And even that super duper blended view of evolution still leaves out things like phenotypic plasticity. And that's a huge factor to survival as well. So like, if you're gonna throw out neo-Darwinism here as the thing that you're trying to disprove, you have to realize that there's a lot more there that you're just kind of ignoring. And if the only thing that you're bringing to the table here is saying that you're gonna disprove deep time to do this, my dude, you are bringing a toothpick to an atom bomb fight. The mechanism claimed to drive evolution is mutation where we'll define mutation as a change in the nucleotide sequence of DNA. So the driving mechanism claimed for evolution is a mutation, and the natural selection looks and sees what effect that mutation had. Mm -hmm. And if it likes it, and this is giving, of course, a lot of power to natural selection it doesn't have, but if natural selection likes it, see, then that organism survives. If it doesn't like it, then that organism dies off. And then you do the next step and you keep repeating that step over and over again. I mean, he's doing a phenomenal job of explaining neo-Darwinism. This is a great way to introduce this concept to like maybe an undergrad class, even like high schoolers. This could be like the total understanding of evolution that they need to get a good handle on how this works. Now, why do I get the feeling that he's about to completely just crap the bed in the next sentence? The idea being that somehow in that process, the fish who only breathes oxygen through water, who doesn't have legs, whose vision is based upon seeing through water, not seeing through air, somehow plops up on land and through these very slow processes, transforms its entire anatomy and physiology where it can breathe air, it can walk on land, and it can see in air. And there it is. It's not somehow we know the process. Fish today who live in low oxygen environments will occasionally come up to the surface and gulp air to get the oxygen that they need. It's not crazy to see how that kind of thing might be so beneficial that over time it happens more and more regularly. Here's a fun fact for you. Lungs evolved before swim bladders did. Swim bladders are actually modified lungs. So lungs came into existence and then some fish kept the lungs and used them to become better fish. How cool is that? We have fossils of Sarcopterygian fish with shoulder girdles and big thick wrists and hand bones that were in the transition to becoming amphibians. And as far as the whole concept of it just being inconceivable that a fish could learn how to like see and breathe on land, might I remind you that lungfish exist. There's a whole clade of them. Dipnoi, I believe. That is a whole bunch of fish that stayed in that weird in-between niche that was opened up by this transition that you think is somehow illogical. So, like, there's living proof today that what you're saying here is nonsense. 
And so they see it as you give me enough time, mm -hmm. we can account for all of this. See, now it really doesn't, but time becomes one of those things to a human. You know, yeah, it's almost like anything can happen given enough time. Mind gets fuzzy when you... Yes, <laughs> and they it. hide behind that fuzziness. Ah, uh, it just took a long time. Somehow that becomes the magic wand. You know, a long time, poof, there it is. Mm -hmm. Forget the idea that there's no biological mechanism that accomplishes that. Time, poof, we got it. What do you mean, no biological mechanisms? There are plenty of biological mechanisms. You just got done explaining a couple of the biological mechanisms. What are you talking about? Darwin wrote his original ideas in a time where there was very little known about the cell and even less known about genetics. Now, Gregor Mendel, who's the, kind of considered the father of genetics, he did the pea plant studies and all that, he and Darwin were peers. And there was even found in Darwin's library an unopened copy of Mendel's paper. But it's questionable even if Darwin would have opened it, if he would have understood it, because, and that's not, that's not putting Darwin down, that's just a matter of most people in that time didn't understand Mendel's studies. They just simply didn't understand it. And so Darwin proposed these ideas and they became very popular at a time where genetics and even cellular biochemistry was not well understood. So in essence, there was this big vacuum of lack of knowledge that they were able to quickly step into and we could just pretend that it all made sense because maybe, maybe not. We just simply didn't know. I mean, I'm glad to hear that you understand that Darwin and Mendel were contemporaries, but the conclusion that you're drawing from that, that evolution is some ridiculous hypothesis that was just thrown out with no real evidence, that makes no sense. Darwin didn't know anything about genetics. Mendel didn't know anything about natural selection. But if you notice, On the Origin of Species isn't a college textbook. We mention Darwin because he was the first one to really publish this idea of natural selection, but we don't worship Darwin. He was wrong about a lot of things. And so we've moved on. And Darwin's ideas mixed with Mendel's ideas that you just explained combined to make a new theory called Neo-Darwinism, which you just explained. Like, did you think that your audience just wouldn't notice that you just said one thing and then said the exact opposite? Or are you just kind of banking on the idea that nobody knows what these words mean? You could not, and this is a challenge I put out over and over again, you could not today present Darwinism and it be accepted because we would know better. But because it's already accepted, then, well, it must work somehow. Huh. Yeah. If On the Origin of Species was published today, it would absolutely be rejected. Why? Because it's a book from the 1800s. It doesn't have access to all the data that we've collected in almost 200 years since it was published. So yes, it would be thrown out. Fortunately, Darwinism doesn't mean only and exactly what Darwin said. If the theory of evolution as we presently understand it was presented today, it would be massively celebrated. Because, as the geneticist Theodosius Dovsansky said, nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolution. Like, I'm starting to think that you're not just being willfully dishonest here. I'm starting to think that you actually don't know how this stuff works. Several years ago, I listened to a Nobel laureate give a talk, and in that talk, he describes cellular systems as Rube Goldbergs. You know what that is, where it'd be all hobbled together. And he was a Nobel laureate trying to claim that because of evolution, evolution just hobbles things together, whatever works. So the cellular systems are all hobbled together. So he called them Rube Goldbergs. And even at that time, I thought that's a very, very 
foolish thing, especially in absence of not knowing. But what we already knew, I felt challenged what he said. I would defy him to say that today in the face of what we know about cellular systems today. They're not Rube Goldbergs. They are enormously sophisticated where we still don't understand. It's still beyond that. And the DNA is a classic example. The Human Genome Project, the irony is that instead of the Human Genome Project destroying the foundations of biblical creation and all that, it has been one of the biggest booms, one of the greatest things for creation to ever happen. Because among other things, what it has shown is it has shown that in each cell in your body that has chromosomes, there is a system going on there that we don't yet have more than the very minor understanding of. Good gravy. What a weird amalgamation of the God of the Gaps argument and the fine-tuning argument. You don't know how the body works. Yes, we do. You don't know how cells work. Yes, we do. Well, you don't know how the genome works. Yes, we do. Well, you don't know every little bit of it. And even if you did, it's all so complex that clearly it must be controlled by something. Like, can you imagine how silly it would be if a meteorologist made these exact claims? Because they used to. You don't know how lightning works. Yeah, actually, it's, it's just electricity. Well, you don't know what controls the electricity. It's ions, actually. Well, you don't know what makes the ions work. And even if you did, it's all so intricate and perfect that clearly it must be a god. It's just you're making this god an ever-shrinking pocket of ignorance. Until finally you have nowhere left to hide, so it just explodes and now it's everything again. Just boring and lazy, dude. And oh, I'll get people to write me, what about this and what about that? Well, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't understand mutations. I've spent 20 years studying mutations. Let's take a look at some of Dr. Anderson's work over his 20 years of studying mutations. All right, so I just went to Google Scholar and looked up Kevin Anderson. It's kind of a mess, but I did check out his creation wiki page, found out that his middle initial is L. So I've got here Kevin L. Anderson Evolution typed into Google Scholar. And here's two papers right away. The first one is published by the Proceedings of the International Conference on Creationism. That's at least a published paper. Uh, it's published through Cedarville University. Let's look that up. It's a private Christian university. The other one here is published in the Creation Research Society Quarterly. So that's definitely not peer reviewed, but let's double check. So this is a search engine of scientific journals out of Stony Brook University. It's a great way to see if a journal is actually legitimate. So I'm just gonna look up the Creation Research Society. Yeah, big surprise, there's nothing there. Looking back at this paper here at the bottom, it says that Kevin works at the Van Andel Creation Research Center. So. He's not working among peers in his field. He's working in a place that values ideas like his. Uh, let's look a little bit more into this dude. So back here on the Creation Wiki page, it says that he got his PhD from Kansas State, that he taught at Mississippi State, and that he is actually the director of the Van Andel Creation Research Society, and that he is the editor-in-chief of the Creation Research Society Quarterly. So he's publishing his own work in a journal that he's the chief editor for. That's not necessarily awful, but yikes, that's concerning. I can't stop looking at this paper. What are these graphics? Why are they so low res? Like this, this wouldn't fly in an essay for a bachelor's degree, much less a scientific publication. It looks like his whole argument here is that because the mutations that he's observing are like just shutting genes off, rather than building new ones, that it's not real evolution, and that it doesn't tell us where the genes come from, and so we can't say that evolution's real. It, th this makes no sense. Like, even if you wanted to split hairs here and say that it's microevolution, not macroevolution, it's still a change in allele frequencies in a population across generations. This is still talking about evolution. So, I'm gonna do two things. Since Dr. Anderson clearly isn't familiar with the concept of peer review, first of all, I'm going to put the link to this paper in the description for this video. So you can go and read it and, uh, you know, let me know what you think in the comments. And then number two, I'm going to send this to a few friends who are familiar with peer review and see what they have to say. I'm actually recording this 
before I do that. So we'll see how that goes, I guess. <laughs> if if it works and it goes well, you'll know about it right now. Hey, Pete. Hey, Forrest. How you doing? My name is Peter White. I'm an associate professor of evolution education and entomology at Michigan State University. Hey, what's going on, Seth? Hey, Forrest. I'm doing great. Good to see you. Yeah, so I got my undergrad in wildlife biology from the University of Montana, and then I went on to the University of Maryland for my master's and PhD, where I got to spend four years in Australia studying satin bowerbirds. Um, from there, I uh, then took a postdoctoral fellowship at Texas A&M University and then moved back up here to Washington State. Hey, there, Lena. Hey, Forrest. I'm Lena. I'm a fifth year PhD candidate at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where I'm getting my PhD in astrobiology, and I'm also a NASA graduate fellow. Hey there, Cole. Hello, my name is Cole Creighton. I am better known on TikTok as Cole the Science Dude, where I make fun videos about science. And uh, I used to be a citizen scientist for many years, but now I work as the director of research for a cannabis company in Michigan called Grasshopper Farms. Hey, Ben. Hey, Forrest, what's going on? Uh, my name is Dr. Ben Ryan. I'm a neuroscientist at Stanford University. I'm also a science communicator uh, on TikTok and other platforms. What's up, Isaac? Hey, Forrest, good to see you. I teach eighth grade science in Kansas, so I have a lot of the evolution unit. So I sent you Dr. Anderson's paper. What were your thoughts? I think the author makes two mistakes in the paper. For the first mistake, what he's pointing out, he's saying, look, antibiotic resistance is based on various genes and proteins being rendered non-functional through mutation. So because in this case, biological changes resulting in things breaking, it's actually not a good exemplar of evolution. The mistake he makes here is that evolution is not exclusively limited to the making of things. In fact, in his paper, the definition of evolution that he uses is descent with modification. Well, when a genetic sequence is rendered non-functional through mutation, and that's passed on to future generations of bacteria, that's precisely descent with modification. The second mistake, and this is a bit of a shorter one, he concludes that because bacteria develop antibiotic resistance by turning off genes or, or rendering genes non-functional, that evolution can therefore not explain where those genes came from in the first place. And when I phrase it that way, I think we can see how erroneous and maybe even a little bit nonsensical that that conclusion might be. I almost feel like that these scientists sometimes are like Bilbo Baggins and they see this, this missing scale on the dragon smaug, right? And they think if they put an arrow in that scale that, that just the whole dragon dies. This paper just focuses on origin, origin, origin. If you can't identify the specific origin of a genetic mechanism that is say lost function or allowed a bacterium to resist a particular antibiotic, that that, that brings the whole dragon down. And that's just not, the, the wonderful thing about science is that's not how science works. That's just one piece of the puzzle. And it doesn't mean you don't still have an almost complete puzzle. And then on top of that, the entire argument that we need to know the origin of every single genetic mechanism to then make some claim that that, that precludes the operation of, of evolution as, as we talk about it is, I mean, it's kind of ludicrous. It's, it's just not a, uh, a solid argument. It's, it's trying to do something pretty ambitious, which is to cast out or overthrow a, a very well accepted framework to explain a lot of natural phenomena in the biological realm. And it's not presenting any new data necessarily, but it's trying to reframe data and suggest that there is a better way to explain it than through evolutionary theory. Um, and that is, you know, that's those are pretty big claims. And so what I'd be looking for if this came across my desk as a reviewer is, well, does this new framework explain the existing data better than the current one? Does it present any new evidence or does it does it show that the evidence fits better with with the tenets or the or the assumptions that that, that other framework has? And then I'd also be looking for how well represented the current framework is. So I think that this paper failed to do both of those things because the strategy that it seems to use is to misrepresent or mischaracterize the existing framework and also simultaneously does not provide any new evidence that supports the alternative framework. So I think that that is my, those are my general thoughts. And as a result of that, I'd probably recommend rejecting it just based on, on those two facts. One of the things that was very odd from my perspective 
uh, was that the paper seemed to rely a lot on logical fallacies to arrive at the conclusion, including in many of the examples that the author themselves offered. So they kept refer using this line, they would say, uh, however, a mutation that causes a loss of regulatory control does not offer a genetic mechanism that can account for the origin of this regulatory control, which is very odd. A, that's not actually a requirement that a thing be able to explain uh, both how it got there and how it went away. But more importantly, in the example that they use in that line, where they talk about this regulatory protein called MAR-R, that inhibits the production of the efflux pumps mar a and mar b after five minutes of googling i was able to find another article online that shows that a that a decrease in mar r the regulatory protein actually causes a uh, net loss in the genetic spreading of any uh, given bacteria there were birth defects there were a variety of other problems with regards to like you know ampicillin resistance or some kind of antibiotic resistance in a condition an environmental condition in which that is necessary to procreate it will obviously natural selection will select for the the genes that allow something to procreate in an environment with antibiotics that doesn't mean that whatever regulatory control or cell functions are getting shut off aren't beneficial outside of the extreme scenario of growing in an antibiotic and the really sad thing to me is that um, there is a, a valid and interesting argument to be had regarding the importance that we place upon horizontal gene transfer with regards to how that affects our understanding of kind of neo-Darwinian evolution, right? This is a, an interesting question and we should look at how, because there's been a lot of evidence that uh, horizontal gene transfer is really important with regards to the genetic diversity that we see in the prokaryotic domains of bacteria and archaea. But the approach that he came in the paper, uh, having this be like evolution versus creationism, was just a very odd take for an academic paper. And overall, I am not a professor, but I would give this paper an F. It's described on the website as, quote, emphasizing the reinterpretation of existing scientific data within a creationist framework. And I just thought that was so interesting. Um, and then I just was pissed off the whole rest of the way. So my, basically my, my end result was pissed off. It felt like he was trying to find a way to finish his sentence, but he like couldn't really quite figure it out a lot of the time. Like I've been there a lot of the time where I write a sentence and I'm like, I'm just need to get this out and I'm going to come back and I'm going to revise it and make it better later. But he just like never went back and did that. He makes the assumption early on that any change in genotype will alter cellular function in a negative way. And I thought that was senseless. His arguments when he starts breaking down each of the antibiotic resistance pathways and stuff is he says, this does not provide an explanation for the original molecules binding affinity for the antibiotic. And this was just puzzling for me. I, I just didn't understand why he felt the mechanism through which bacteria evade an antibiotic must also explain the, anti the bacteria's original vulnerability to the antibiotic. I just don't understand that as an argument. And that's, that was like the whole argument too. Like that was the whole thing. So I just didn't feel like that was really strong. Like I thought that his arguments were a reasonable debate against whether or not bacterial antibiotic resistance in vitro should be considered like a, the model of evolution because of like, there's a lot of other good examples of it. And, and I felt like at parts he was like kind of getting there and I was like, okay, I see a little bit of his argument, but then like, he just like blew it back open. He's like, this is why evolution doesn't exist. And it's like, okay, no, that's not the case. You know, and I have a quote from his paper that I just did not understand. It really epitomizes the entire thing is, and he says that if a house, if you take out an interior wall of a house, that's like the equivalent thing. And he says, quote, while this larger dining room may be desirable, the mechanism of removing this wall cannot legitimately be offered as an example of how this interior wall was originally built. And I just thought, first off, it kind of can, because when you're taking down the wall, you're going to get to see everything in there and how it was built. But also, like, why? I just didn't understand that. Like, it, that, that whole debate makes me question his understanding of biology. But yeah, it's just shocking. And overall, thumbs down. Right away, the first word was evolutionists. And I knew from there, this was going to have a bit of a bias. Really from what just within the first little bit of the paper, he starts talking about how many bacteria become resistant by acquiring genes from plasmids via horizontal gene transfer. 
And that got my kind of mind ticking as this may end up being misleading. And the author even admits that when he talks about what the definition of evolution is. And he mentions that it's a change in gene frequency over time. But unfortunately, by the second page, when he starts putting up his entire straw man, he's no longer arguing against evolutionary change over time. He is now admitting that he is going to change the definition into it in his paper, and he is going to argue against descent with modification. Basically, arguing that antibacterial resistance isn't evidence worth proving like common ancestry. Evolution is in the bigger picture. It's even right here highlighted. Therefore, these genetic changes offer no example of a genetic mechanism for the evolutionary acquisition of flight by non-flying organisms, cognition by non-cognitive organisms, photosynthesis by non-photosynthesizing organisms, etc. And like, yeah, I agree. I'm an eighth grade middle school science teacher, and I would never tell my students that antibacterial resistance is evidence of any of that. It's not, but it is evidence of evolutionary change, which is what you set out to answer. Well, thank you so much for your thoughts. And before I let you go, do you have anything going on that you want people to know about? Yeah, well, one of the more recent things I've been working on is something called the Connected Bio Project. You can go to connectedbio.org. And we've put together a set of interactive online lessons. I've worked with a group called the Concord Consortium. It's for high schoolers where they can learn about the process of evolution. Here, they're looking at mouse fur color in a species called Paramiscus polyanotis. They can look at the genetic sequences. They can look at how new proteins are formed, how pigment is, is formed in these mice. And then how at an organismal level, natural selection actually acts on these mice with different fur colors and how allele frequencies can then change over time in, in, in populations. So it's really looking at evolution from nucleotides all the way through to populations. So that's connectedbio.org. Feel free to check it out if you have a chance. So I feel like I've got a couple of exciting things that I'm working on right now. Um, Chuck Darwin on TikTok. So just at Chuck Darwin on TikTok. It's a lot of science content. You'll see a little like, maybe some peppering of little social justice and some funny stuff, but it's largely science. Um, and my love of science and nature just live there. Um, you can also find some of the things that I create. So I love the you know, Sasquatch. Um, I love working with vinyl and fabrics and stuff. It satisfies my creative side. So if you're on um, Instagram, you can, you can find my stuff at Chuck Darwin Designs. That's all one word, at Chuck Darwin Designs. And I also have an Etsy shop, Chuck Darwin Designs. So check it out. Thanks very much. Yeah, so check out my TikTok channel, which is where I post most of my science communication content. My handle is at Charm Quarks with a Z at the end. Um, and then I've also recently started uh, creating new content for my Instagram specifically, which is the same handle at Charm Quarks. Anyone that would like to find my content on the internet, you can find me on pretty much all social media under the name Cole the Science Dude. Remember that's Cole the Science Dude, not Cole the Science Guy. And I look forward to seeing you around. Check out my social medias, I suppose. Um, you know, TikTok at Dr. Brain, Instagram at Dr. Brain, Twitter at Dr. Brain. Um, if you want to check out my research papers, feel free to you know check out my Google Scholar. My name is Ben Ryan, actually. R -E -I -N. So I'd say go check out my TikTok account if you want to learn more about evolution, especially human evolution. I'm really interested in the ancient human species, so I love talking about that. My Twitter's at irussell21, and I would highly recommend watching this experiment. You can watch it on YouTube. We'll put the link in here, but you can watch as bacteria evolves over time, and you can see the evolutionary change and this is one of those that is not just gene flow. This includes mutation. So it seems to kind of debunk this study as a whole. I don't know if I should have said study, but at that point, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you see that, Kevin? That's peer review. If you had done that before you published this paper, it would have saved you a lot of embarrassment. Beneficial mutations, you know, we define a beneficial mutation as a mutation that provides a benefit to the organism. In other words, I'm now resistant to the antibiotic, mm -hmm. which is beneficial if that antibiotic's around, you know, okay? Uh, as a human, I like to drink milk, okay? I have a mutation in me that allows me to drink milk. It's a mutation. See? Always to, all right. To, to okay. me, it's beneficial, you know, but it's still a mutation. It's also a great example of evolution. Lactose tolerance is caused by one single point mutation, one single nucleotide.
that changes and is so beneficial that it spread throughout a massive population of people. Good example. If you look just at beneficial mutations, which is what evolutionists love to look at, beneficial, 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 and I say, but that's really irrelevant. What's happening at the genetic level? That's the key. It's not whether it's beneficial or not beneficial, it's what's happening genetically. But the beneficial mutations are genetic. Saying that the mutations aren't important, it's what's happening at the genetic level, it's like saying being blonde or brunette doesn't matter, it's your hair color that we're looking for. It's like saying epinephrine isn't important, it's the adrenaline. They're the same thing, dude. Repeatedly, what the evolutionist community does is they offer example after example after example of what they claim, here's how evolution works. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Because what you're doing is you're taking pre-existing systems and knocking them out or reducing them. You're not explaining how they evolved to begin with. Because that's not what those papers that you just showed were talking about. Evolution can be reductive or it can be additive. Either way, a change in allele frequencies in a population over the course of multiple generations is evolution. There's nothing in the definition that says that it can never lose anything or that it always has to gain or that you have to know where it came from otherwise you don't know anything. Like, all you're doing here is saying, I don't know how this works, therefore it must be magic. If I don't know where my car was manufactured, that doesn't mean that I don't know how the engine works or that it isn't a car. It's the analogy of if you have a house, and in your house you have the dining room and a wall and then your recreation room. And your wife being, you know, the big socialite that she is, she wants a bigger dining room to entertain her parties. Well, you have a choice. I can keep my rec room or I can knock at that wall and get a bigger dining room. Well, you know, everybody knows happy wife is a happy home. Let's strike anybody else as sexist. So you knock out the inner wall and they have a bigger dining room. And it's beneficial because she's happy. But don't tell a carpenter that how you built the house was by knocking out a wall. But that's what evolutionists do repeatedly is they give you an illustration of knocking out a wall and this is how the house was built. Mm -hmm. This dude seriously has one argument. Like this is the exact same nonsense from the paper. Kevin, nobody's saying that knocking down a wall is how you build a house. What we are saying is that the processes by which you can knock down a wall are also some of the processes by which you can build a house. And either way, knocking down the wall is an adaptive change. It would be evolution if that floor plan was now so much better that all the new houses on the block started being built with a bigger dining room without this wall. You're mixing up acclimatization, adaptation, and evolution. It's a freshman mistake. Your analogy's bad and you should feel bad. Now, Kevin, a lot of your uh, research was, it was done in the area of studying bacteria. Correct. Is that correct? Correct, yes. Particularly mutations in bacteria. Yeah. Let me give an example. To become resistant to certain types of antibiotics, some bacteria will eliminate an enzyme or a transport protein. Just get rid of it. Now, if a human got rid of a certain enzyme or transport protein, we'd probably die. If we didn't die, we certainly wouldn't be very healthy. Sweet, merciful Ghibli. You just gave an example of that happening just a couple of minutes ago. You talked about lactose tolerance as a mutation. You have a gene that produces an enzyme called lactase that breaks down the sugar lactose. Around age five, that gene gets methylated and shuts off. That's why lactose intolerance is also called lactase non-persistence. Lactose tolerance, or lactase persistence, occurs when a single point mutation stops that methylation from happening, so more lactase is produced, so more lactose can be broken down throughout the course of your life. That's a reductive mutation. We are stopping a process from occurring and we are benefiting from it. We didn't die. We didn't get sick like you just said. Like, this is like the second or third time 
that you've explained an observable example of evolution and then said that that kind of thing is impossible. Like, how dumb do you think your audience is? Humans can't do that so easy. We can't just shut things on and off like that. And particularly because we're, our generation time is, you know, every 20 years, not every 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Bacteria, because of the generation time, they can reproduce very quickly and they can pay what is called cost of selection. So what works for bacteria doesn't really work very well for animals. But because bacteria is so easy to study, they like to extrapolate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like say, well, look, this is how it would work in the animal too. Well, not necessarily. So the comparison of us and bacteria only goes so far and then it starts falling down. You literally just got done explaining that bacteria are good models because they have such a short generation time. And now in the same breath, you're saying that bacteria aren't humans and they work different ways than humans do. So we just can't, we just can't know anything about it. They're just so different that we just can't learn anything about evolution. It's just not real. They're models, dude. That's not really DNA either. It's a model. And a little airplane, it's a model. Can't get on it and fly. Nobody's saying that bacteria work the exact same way that humans work. They are teaching tools. You're a microbiologist. If I were to expose a large container of bacteria to a very, very traumatic environmental condition, like starve them for an amino acid, I may kill 99.9999% of that population of bacteria. But the next day, those few that are left that have the mutation that allows them to compensate for, you know, lack of a particular amino acid in the media, mm -hmm. they've regrown and the whole population is restored again. Just boom, just like that. This is seriously like the most frustrating episode we've ever done. You forgot the second half of that. You forgot the second part, the most important part of that whole scenario is that you created a disturbance. You killed off most of the bacteria, but not all of them. So the small population that's left is resistant to that kind of disturbance. So now when they reproduce and repopulate, the whole population is going to now be more resistant to that kind of disturbance. You created a bottleneck and now we're seeing the founder effect. These are like associate's degree level vocab words. Like if what you described made any sense, if this really, really wasn't proof of evolution, then MRSA wouldn't exist. Because this is how antibiotic resistant bacteria happen. You don't use antibiotics properly, and so you don't kill all the bacteria. And the ones that survive are the most resistant. They were able to survive all the antibiotics that you did use. They repopulate and now the whole population is stronger. And so you need more and stronger antibiotics to kill them off. Like, I, I don't get how you keep just running face first into the point over and over and over and you're still somehow missing it. Like, I seriously feel like I just spent the last 16 minutes of my life watching a person beat their head against a wall to prove to me that walls don't exist. Whereas with humans, if you wipe out 99.99999% of the humans, first off, that's a potential extinction event. Mm -hmm. But second off, even if we do, ex even if we do survive, how many centuries and millennia will it take for us to recover from mm -hmm. that? See, so bacteria can pay that extremely high cost of selection, where you eliminate almost all of them, but a few survive and the population returns back very quickly and what, voila, evolution has occurred. Mm -hmm. That's what we're told. Mm -hmm. And I can't really do that in humans and in dogs and in cows and such. They don't respond that way. This is apocalyptically aggravating because this guy was a professor. How many students heard that? You know what else is different between bacteria and humans? Bacteria don't have sex. And that's one of the many reasons why Haldane's cost of selection dilemma, which you just laid out, doesn't hold any water. Haldane's calculations used a fitness constraint that totally invalidated his own assumed population size. And he didn't take crossing over into account. So he thought the two mutations would take twice the amount of time. And that's why in his own paper, he said that his calculations would probably need, and I'm quoting here, 
drastic revisions. And when you do revise his calculations to include real numbers, his proposed cost of selection disappears. I didn't even have to learn that like in a college class. I learned that in independent study because I give a crap about this stuff. Haldane made your argument in the 50s and it has been refuted again and again and again since then. In fact, you know what? I just went to Google Scholar and typed in Haldane's Dilemma. Here's a paper published in Genome called Sex Solves Haldane's Dilemma. You should probably keep up with Genome, you know, since you study mutations and all that. Here's another one published in the Proceedings for the National Academy of Sciences in 1974 titled Solutions to the Cost of Selection Dilemma. The last line of the abstract reads, The special genotypic and populational conditions required for rapid evolutionary change in genetically complex characters are not unusual in higher organisms. I don't know when you finish school, dude, but your knowledge is woefully out of date. And for you not to understand something that is this central to our discipline, or just to be willfully ignorant of it, and then to go on to be a professor, is seriously disconcerting. And your repeated use of flashy, fancy vocab words that consistently prove you wrong is not a good strategy. And that's why your arguments are being shot down so easily. And the rest of us are learning from that and moving forward with better arguments. You see that? That's a change in populations across generations. We call it evolution. It's pretty cool, right? Well, Kevin, how would you define science, first of all? I just simply define science as a tool that we use to understand the world around us. Mm -hmm. And it's just simply a tool. Now, within science, there's obviously a certain methodology. But science itself is just a general approach that's used to try to understand, you know, what's happening. Understand what do we see here? Understand what is it that causes thunder? What is it that causes earthquakes? You know, what is it that causes you to be sick? It's never been a matter of science this way, creation that way. Science this way, the Bible that way. You're right. Science is a tool for understanding the universe. But in order for a tool to be effective, it has to be used properly. I can use a hammer to drive a nail, or I can bash it into the dirt. Only one of those actions is going to help me build a house. So with science, you need to set constraints on what you are and are not going to believe is true. And namely, that constraint needs to be, are you going to believe something without evidence? You're sitting here as a scientist believing in cell theory and germ theory and the theory of plate tectonics and the theory of gravity and the theory of relativity, all because of the evidence that they bring to the table. Some of those are remarkably counterintuitive. And yet, with this one thing, with creationism, you have a totally different set of rules. Where now, all of a sudden, you don't have any evidence, you don't need any evidence, you're going off of the lack of what you consider to be sufficient evidence for something else and implanting this insane either-or fallacy where, well, I've decided that all of the evidence for evolution just isn't quite good enough for me, therefore it can only possibly be magic. And then you're going to go on to say that it's not science versus the Bible, that these two things are one and the same. But in the Bible, it says that in the end times, stars are going to rain down out of the sky and land on earth. And you should know that stars are millions of times bigger than the earth and light years away. So for you to sit here and say that with a straight face is saying that in this one special case, you don't care about evidence and you don't care about critical thinking and that's insane. By the way, has anybody else noticed that this dude's been wearing gloves this whole time for no reason? Like, I keep waiting for him to, like, break out a Petri dish or to, like, do something, show me some sort of physical example. I, th I think he just put the gloves on to look more like a real scientist. Come at me, bro. Evolution as an official scientific idea, as in what's in the literature, what's in the textbooks, what's talked about at scientific meetings. Is God ever in any of that? Of course not. Evolution is viewed as kicking God out. So as a Christian, why would I ever be attracted to something that prides itself on kicking God out? Hey, Editing Forest here. 
I'm surprised that I missed this the first time I watched this whole video. I think I was just so tired and so done with it that I just couldn't handle it anymore. But now going back and rewatching this, I have to say something about that ridiculous argument. The idea that science is all about removing God from the equation and that evolution is all about just kicking God out. When Napoleon met with the great French mathematician Pierre-Simon Laplace, he mentioned that he was really distressed that Laplace had done such great work in explaining the whole universe and how this whole thing works, but he never once mentioned the universe's creator. To which Laplace replied, I had no need for that hypothesis. Science is not kicking God out. We're ignoring a hypothesis that we have no evidence to support, and quite frankly, no need for. You're not oppressed. You're just wrong. Well, this one was immensely frustrating. Guys like this are why I always say, a degree doesn't make you a scientist. I once had a genetics professor in college. He was a PhD geneticist who didn't know what a Hox gene was when I asked him who didn't know how to use a percent sign correctly, and who had to be corrected by the class several times because he kept teaching things that were contradicted by the textbook. After about the second or third time that happened, I left and stopped showing up to class. I taught myself genetics in the hallways, and as a result, I got a higher score on my major field exam than a lot of my classmates did. Because guys like that aren't interested in learning anything new. They're not interested in correcting themselves. All they want to do is regurgitate the information that they learned in college however many years ago. They confuse schooling and education, and they forget that learning is supposed to be a lifelong endeavor. So I hope that you watching this remember that. Degrees don't make scientists. Publications don't make scientists. The degrees that I've achieved and the research that I've done has nothing to do with me being a scientist. What makes a scientist is curiosity, integrity, and the ability to change your mind when presented with new evidence. If you can question everything, assume nothing, and follow the evidence wherever it leads, the universe is yours. As for this guy, I give him a science teacher challenge level 6 out of 10. His arguments suck, but for the average person, especially a young person who's just starting out in college, they see that PhD after his name, they hear all these big words, they see the gloves, this can all be pretty convincing. But if you've actually put in the work to learn how to formulate a scientific argument, you'll quickly realize that uh, he is not. Thank you so much for watching, for liking, for commenting, for subscribing, and all the other stuff that you do here on YouTube. Please exit through the gift shop on your way out, pick up one of these sweet t-shirts. If you like Terrible Podcasts, I've got one of those linked down below as well. And don't forget to go to nordvpn.com slash Labs to take charge of your internet privacy. Trust me, I'm wearing gloves. Have an awesome rest of your day, and never stop learning. Bye-bye. Oh, this you crazy mother...